It's now my great pleasure to welcome, coming to us from the Egyptian Cultural Heritage Organization, Janet Johnstone, who will be giving us a talk and demonstration on practical dressmaking for ancient Egyptians, ancient sewing techniques, and replica clothing construction. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And can you hear me? Because I, like Rosalind, like to speak very loudly. So can you hear all right? Yeah? More? Maybe got Yeah? OK, then. First, um, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about myself and, and what I actually do. And I research and make ancient Egyptian clothing. And this involves every aspect of the subject. But I'm particularly interested in the cut and the construction of the clothing. And um, I like to know how they were worn, how they were made, uh, what they looked like on the body, and how they performed. But the creation and construction alone provides uh, very little information regarding the experience of wearing and living in these clothes. Um, I construct the clothing, I get a model to walk around looking wonderful, and, but it hardly gives a realistic interpretation of ancient Egyptian daily life. I want to see these garments worn to the point of destruction. I want to see them so that I can look at the creasing, the sweat markings on them. I want to know the comfort level, how practical they are to wear, and the strengths and weaknesses of the design, fabric, and construction. So my research, I, um, I look at all the... Um, I'm, I'm looking mainly at um, the extant examples, such as the Tarkan dress, I'm also looking at tomb scenes um, and uh, pictorial representations of the Egyptians. And in many ways, it's quite difficult to um, really analyze what they're wearing. It looks quite obvious, but when you actually go to put these clothes together, it isn't that obvious. Luckily, um, the BBC History Department um, asked me to work as a consultant for a um, series of ancient Egypt documentaries. And here was my opportunity to extend my research into experimental archaeology. I would go along um, onto, onto the film sets, I'd provide all the costume, and I could observe the actors actually wearing the clothing on the film sets. And this may sound bizarre, um, but the clothing was subjected to a lifetime of wear within a matter of days. Um, and so I was able to um, really observe just what I wanted from um, being on the film sets. Now, first of all, just how authentic are my clothes? If we have a look at this little group here, uh, this is Merizang and his wife and daughter from the Cairo Museum. And they're just very typically an old kingdom uh, group. He's uh, wearing that short wrap-over kilt, which is just as you imagine it, just round the hips and wraps over and is secured around the waist. And his wife and daughter are wearing that very stereotypical straight, tight-fitting dress um, with a deep plunge neck. And again, it was this very mute point, do, did they actually wear this style of dress? And I've been so inspired by Anne's um, uh, talk about the, you know, the crimpled um, uh, fabrics that I would very, you know, I'm very pleased that uh, I can now start looking at these kind of fabrics to make this very, very um, stylized dress. But if I'm in my role as a researcher, I can, I'm looking at this uh, from one way. But if I then go and I'm asked to work um, as a consultant, um, quite often I'll meet with a television director or a, or a TV producer. And they may say, oh, we want to, we're doing um, pyramid builders again. And, <laughs> and we want old kingdom clothing. And I say, yes, that's fine. Um, and I said, well, I'll show you some authentic um, sort of old kingdom clothing. Look, I said, this, this dress here, this is what uh, we feel that this was actually worn. Uh, the one, uh, the Tarkan dress, in fact, has um, crease marks and staining that it was a, worn in a daily life. Um, so, first of all, I make three different types of 
uh, garment, um, three different versions of every garment. Now, this thing sounds quite bizarre. So this is my replica, and it's as close as I can get to the original. It's a handling um, example. It's not to be worn, really, unless I could find a lovely little slender girl to put that on. But um, it's just for people to have a look inside, turn it inside out, have a look at the sewing in there. And so that's my replica. But, as I said, I, I can't actually get anyone to really fit that dress. I then have to make an authentic reproduction with a costume finish, which is this version. So this is a version of the Tarkhan dress, but it's actually been customised, so it will actually fit um, uh, a modern figure. And this was made for a lady in particular who had quite a big bust. So it's, you know, it does look quite roomy. Um, <laughs> 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 And also, instead of just being a pull-on dress like this one, uh, the, the original, I have to put an opening down the side with um, uh, hooks and bars so that it can go on easily. And um, then, finally, if I just I could show you, that's the, one of the extant uh, examples from the Petrie Museum. And... So that's how I want my old kingdom ladies to wear their clothing. And that's a picture. This was taken at um, the Hidden Histories event that the Petrie Museum put on. It was a, a wonderful project where um, they were restoring and um, conserving the jewellery, um, and the, especially the beads in the collection. And it involved the Sudanese community who came and were involved in the project and at the end, we had this great celebration, and we had an afternoon of music and lovely food, and we put a show on. And I didn't want to dress the girls to look like ancient Egyptians. I wanted them to be themselves, but to wear the clothes. And so this is a, uh, one of the girls wearing that dress. Now, again, going back to my three different versions, I have to make then a complete costume. This is what the uh, TV producers and directors want to see. They want uh, that picture that's a stylized version of, uh, of, of, uh, of this straight dress. So I then have to make this, which is real costume. And it does up at the back with hooks and bars. It does under the, down the side with hooks and bars. It's mounted on calico because that's how you make costumes. And um, it's pretty sturdy. It's also dyed um, a slightly beigey colour. It's called reindeer. I don't know why. <laughs> and, and, so um, this is because when it's on television, anything that's white, a lot of white on television, causes a problem with the cameras. And especially if it's on um, um, uh, with a black wig, and they're also filming in um, a, a dark environment, the camera tends to flare up because it can't quite balance the light levels between the skin colours, the, the, the white of the dress and also the hair. So everything you see on television which is white is in fact this colour. Um, so th this, was a, this is obviously a, um, a TV costume. That one is for people to actually try on to experience what it's like to wear that dress. And that one is my, my replica. And of course, I, say to, I do this talk, I show them the examples, and then I say to the television director, so can we use authentic costumes? And they said, no, we want actually this dress here. So, but in a way, it's turned on its head, because um, if I film abroad, um, quite often, obviously, in uh, Muslim countries, the Muslim actresses and extras of a few years ago were quite happy to wear this style of dress, but are now don't want to be seen wearing it. And so I have to take on all these cultural mores as well, and I quite agree with them. If it's not, I can't force um, my, my actresses to wear something that they're unhappy with. Um, so, in fact, they've, they're doing me a favour because they love wearing that dress. So, in fact, we should be seeing more original <laughs> and, 
and uh, original examples of Egyptian clothing now coming in on, on your television soon. So, now, the, I'm talking about how authentic they are. I, tr I always use a linen thread when I sew. And I have actually this, you know, for the dresses it's fine because it's very, very strong. But uh, for some uh, garments, this is this lovely bead net dress which is from the Petrie Museum. And I've, I've always been fascinated by it and I thought, what would that be like to wear? And I started to mock one up and I couldn't, I couldn't get to, you know, thousands of faience beads. So I thought, what can I use? I need a long tubular bead. So I ended up going to Kingston Market and um, I bought a bamboo bead net curtain. And uh, they weren't quite short enough, so I had to saw each one up and get them to size. And it only just started as a mock-up, um, just to see if you use the netting technique to actually construct it. And uh, I wasn't even going, I was then going to make the um, beads much smaller and, um, uh, and, and you know, uh, and make the, the diamond shapes more, uh, you know, uh, more condensed. But eventually it just got made somehow. Um, it was interesting because the weight of the beads, even though that's only bamboo, um, is, it's a heavy dress. And I realized that you can't actually hang this dress off your shoulders. This is an overdress and there's a white a linen dress underneath. And there, the possibility is that, in fact, um, if we can see this um, serving girl, so this servant statue next, uh, next to uh, the, uh, the replica, well, not replica, the copy. And it's just that um, I've, I was wondering how I could actually make that dress. It could be that these were beaded um, or embroidered directly onto a white ground, onto a white dress. But then it's the movement of it is important. So I found that the best thing to do was that you could just see this red band underneath the model's uh, bust, and the whole dress hangs on that band. It's like a bra strap, really tight round. And then the skirt falls from that point. If it falls from the shoulders and just drops down, it hardly lasts. And I've got good experience. I thought, right, well, I've used bamboo, so that wasn't quite the path I wanted to go. I'll use linen thread. So I constructed the whole thing with linen thread. And here we are at our Hidden History show. And she wore this for half an hour. And she was very, very careful. And you could already see just above the hem, there's a hole has appeared. And by the end of the afternoon, I had a group of little children running around after my model, picking the beads up off the floor because the, they just broke, the thread broke. So I thought, well, this is really interesting because it's now making me think that there, if this dress was even worn, there would have to be, every time it was worn, and I think if it was, it would be for a ceremonial reason, because you can't sit down in it. Um, because obviously you sit down, you destroy the beads. Um, there must have been a whole team of people who every time a garment like this was worn would then have to rethread the whole thing because the linen stretches, the linen thread stretches. Um, so that was, I've now restrung this with polyester thread and, uh, and it does stay on. The other thing I noticed with it is that any person, any woman can wear this, any shape, any size, because it's, um, it's like an a, a elastic, you just, Sort of put, you just put this over your head and it just forms to your body. It's also very attractive as well on any body shape. And um, I know she's a lovely size 10, but um, it does look, <laughs> honestly, it looks lovely on everyone. Right, then the next uh, slide is to do with, if I'm working on a documentary, we often work abroad. And this is Wazazat in Morocco, which is just south of Marrakesh. And what is that is surrounded by film studios. And every studio has, uh, is dedicated to a different subject. We do, I've, I have filmed out in Egypt, but I'm just using this one as an example because I took lots of photographs because I had a bit more time. Um, what is that? Yes, it's, for, uh, it's surrounded by film studios. And this one here, can you guess what they film? Yes. <laughs> it's ancient Egypt. <laughs> and every set, 
um, at the studios. Um, there are monumental staircases, there are temples, small temples, big temples, uh, there's a workers' village, and it's all ancient Egypt. There's another one which is, uh, only has biblical um, uh, films. Um, so the people who work in Wazazat are very uh, uh, condensed into that area, and they all work in the film industry. So all the extras who work uh, on the ancient Egypt uh, documentaries and films um, have their heads are shaved and uh, all the women have really long and they wear their own plaited hair um, and um, all the biblical ones are going around with really long hair and long beards so you you can tell which ones go on. so I'm just going to do a quick tour around just to show you you can visit this place there's a hotel on site as well this is the entrance to a small temple this was used to um, uh, you can see we the, the statues there are coloured, have been painted, and um, well, the art director decided they were going to all be painted out uh, white, so we just got the legs to do on there. And it was originally, this was a film set for um, Asterix and Cleopatra, which was a French film. <laughs> <laughs> this is the entrance to the large temple, and those monumental stairs are actually scaffold boards, so as you walk up, you bounce, because they're all wooden. Um, and um, we've, there was a big scene with the whole cast on there, and it was frightening because you could hear it all creaking. And, uh, this, this is a bit sad, I must say. This is the doorway. Uh, well, one colossal statue's lost her head, but uh, I should have taken a close-up because actually the one on the left is wearing platform shoes, <laughs> which is not very authentic. But there again, there are some places where you can get... A, you know, if you just get the angles right and everything, they, it can be quite sort of realistic. And it also, you know, I know we, we can have a laugh at this, and there's, we've seen TV documentaries where they're, they're, you know, they look so, you know, wrong. But I always think I'd rather we film something like this actually in a studio than go to Egypt and film it actually on site and cause destruction, you know, maybe cause destruction, cause dis uh, you know, disturbance. So, we just have <laughs> just in case you, would, you, know, you thought that was real. And what I do is um, I go over, I've, I've take all my costumes with me, but I also run wardrobe. And part of that is that um, I have uh, a team with me. I have an assistant. I have a female dresser. I have a male dresser because men can only be dressed by men. And then also the um, makeup and the hair and uh, all come under my umbrella. Anything like to do with props or anything handheld then belongs to the art department. So here we have, uh, this was uh, uh, a film uh, to do with uh, Arkanath and Nefertiti, and they're just applying the makeup there. Quite often I'll take two costumes, and um, one will be a beautiful original, and then I'll have to break down the other one. And uh, uh, this will involve having a good go at it with a cheese grater, set fire to it. And I usually fire, look for a nice muddy ditch and then daub it all up and down in the ditch to sort of break it down in case the character falls on hard times. So, um, I also have a jewellery technician and a dresser because the amount of work just putting the clothing on um, means that uh, I have to have someone else just to put the jewellery on. And this is Rakia, she's dressing jewellery and she's quite firm so that really hurts that bracelet going on I can I can guarantee okay now she's just dressing again um, transportation um, I have to I have, will then address all my um, actors and they will go up on the set and they go in a in a van and so they've got their uh, minivan for the princesses and as I was saying quite the Muslim girls are, are, are not happy about being shown in revealing clothes. And the girls themselves took this upon themselves to wear the revealing dress underneath, but then they would put on um, like a, a 
uh, mezeth garment uh, over the top so that it, it, they were covered. Okay, and this is the, the van also went to pick up props and um, here we are, we're, um, this is a big prop um, depot and these are horses. I don't know if Pauline's here but I thought I should not disturb by this. Um, and uh, those were uh, stacked up, there were four of those stacked up on top. And eventually the, re the reconstruction goes through. I try and make it as authentic as possible and I do it by making it as simple as possible because once you start putting on really over the top um, jewellery and um, decoration, it loses it. But the thing is that I'm doing this, um, I've been trained as a, you know, in Western uh, fashion and costume making. And um, so everything I, I construct is going to have a Western tailored effect to it. And I've seen this, uh, I was watching an Italian company filming and the way that they dress is um, completely different. It will have this twist in it, which I could tell an Italian uh, production because there's just this sort of stylish twist. They, and again, with um, uh, an Arabic uh, tailoring tradition will be different as well. So I'm, I feel that I'm coming from one aspect, but it's not really a true aspect because it will have my influence as, as a Westerner on, it, on uh, an Egyptian finish. So and then they're having a procession, and they, just to show the cameraman in the background. And um, this is Arkan, Arkan Nefertiti playing said it, but um, we didn't have any other um, hair pieces for them, so they had to wear their crowns. So they're just having a quiet moment at home with their crowns on. I don't, <laughs> there's only so much I can do. <laughs> but some of them, these girls, the girl on the left isn't wearing a wig, that's her own hair. And um, it's just in here I've got these uh, pleated dresses um, are just a length of very fine um, uh, uh, linen. It's been, this is commercially pleated. And I send this off to... Um, uh, cement pleating of Potter's Bar, and um, they will pleat this with uh, between two pieces of um, two sheets of, of like a tracing paper, and it's it's steam pleated. It's quite it's quite expensive. That dress, uh, even though it's only just one length and it's just tied round, wrapped and tied round the body, the uh, fabric's twenty pound a meter, and the pleating comes up about seven fifty a meter. So there's a hundred pounds worth of fabric just for this, but. Already you can see where the girls have been sitting, there's these wear patterns, go, these creases going across the front there. <coughs> okay, and um, again, just, uh, just wearing this, this uh, wrap around, this uh, complex wrap dress. Because wigs can be a bit of a, a problem. And uh, even if we get the costume looking reasonable, um, wigs are quite difficult to get hold of. And again, it's with we're getting uh, our uh, accessories from um, places like the BBC and Angels. Um, I know every garment that they've got, and um, they made some wigs up for us. Uh, these are Ramesside wigs, and in fact what they've done is got a Charles II type wig and, um, and just put plaits on the bottom. So also there aren't that many to go around, so as one actor comes off, then um, his wig or her wig gets taken off and put on for the next scene. So um, this is uh, again a problem with wigs. Um, with well, this one, I only had five Hittite wigs. So that's the Hittite army lying in the sand. <laughs> and uh, so it took a lot of clever filming and photography. Um, this was the, meant to be an Egyptian messenger walking down through the, uh, the destroyed Hittite army. And that's the tea tent at the very top, which uh, everyone will be aiming for. Um, just, a, a, just a lovely picture of a horse. Um, this horse was meant to walk through the bodies. And as soon as he saw the bodies on the ground, he jumped in the air with all four legs. I've never seen it before. And his rider said... Um, oh no, uh, this horse only knows that people stand up. And if it sees people lying on the floor, it doesn't understand. So um, he, was, he had to really talk to the horse and make him walk through. And just as you can see the horse looking at that body, thinking, I don't understand, <laughs> I really don't. So 
Anyway, that's the costume side of it, and um, it is definitely costume. But what I've um, been, if I start off by looking at what I've, you know, the research and how it, it works in with the film, this is a loincloth, and this is um, a, a man's loincloth, so it is quite sizable. There's a lot of fabric in that. Um, it's constructed where the edges are hand rolled and whipped. So I roll the edge over like that and then take the stitches over. <coughs> the seam down the middle is um, two selvages put together and one selvage is overlapped on the other and then whip stitched. This makes a really, really strong seam. And the thing was that how do I test that out because I can't ask an actor to, wear, to walk around in that all day because they are quite revealing and, and um, so my, my friend's husband said he would wear one for a day so Richard, I haven't got any photographs though so Richard wore this for a day and he is game and um, at the end of it my friend um, wrote a report on Richard wearing the loincloth for the day, in the house only but He's a bit of a show-off, so he might well have gone out in it. And he said it was really interesting because I always wondered why is there this seam down the middle other than is it for economy and cutting the cloth. There are some of these that don't have a seam down the middle. But already you can see there's this, the way that it's cut down here. Uh, there are the ones from the Tomb of Tutankhamun in, um, up there, and they have this uh, swept down back. So I tried making some which were just a triangle and some with this notch back. And the triangle ones, what happens is it, you just get a great big pouch here and um, they don't fit very well. So if we're looking for like a workman's um, loincloth and they could sort of wrap a belt round or something, maybe that would work. But what Richard was saying when he wore this was that, um, in fact, this seam, I've got a... I promised my son I wouldn't demonstrate how, it was, um, how you wear this because he says it's so embarrassing. So I found a diagram. I hope you can see it. It might be a bit faint. This is from Gillian Vogelsang Eastwood, um, the textile industry at Amarna. And you tie, it goes around the waist, and then you pull the tail through the legs. Um, I'm not too sure of the way that she's attached it at the front by just twisting it over because... It's restricted the front, rather. Um, according, <laughs> according to Richard, he wore this all day, and he said it was really comfortable, felt weird to start off with, but it was really comfortable and very supportive. But, <laughs> but what happens is that at the back, where the seam is, um, the seam actually goes between the buttocks and it gives you buttock definition. <laughs> so from the back, you just have a very nice shaped bottom. It, does, it covers the over very well, but it also comes up quite high up the side. And so you get this high leg definition. And in fact, it's, if um, you make it out of a very, very fine um, linen, and um, I've, you know, I have uh, done this, it actually makes quite sexy underwear. <laughs> and so... Um, that one I've, I have tested out, and that really, that does work. But again, I wasn't so convinced by this just twisting the, the tail end round. And what I found was that if you actually pull the front out and over so that this falls down in front, uh, this is far more realistic and looks more uh, uh, how they uh, were shown, uh, the Egyptians are shown. Also, if this, this is long enough, you can actually take it through and, um, and attach it into the back so that all that area is then sort of covered up. But when I was looking at this, I suddenly thought, this, this looks really familiar. And I began to think about the military kilts, you see, with this um, quite often a heart-shaped triangular piece in the front with um, a pleating on it. And I kept looking at it and I kept thinking, how are those military kilts made? And I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll pleat one of these. So we had the demonstration of pleating earlier. And the thing is, that every, when you tend to do it, I do, do this myself, you tend to just pleat one, um, uh, one uh, 
piece of uh, linen at a time. But if you double it over, you can actually pleat up to a double uh, portion of linen. So I pleated down along, along that level there, along that line. And it brings in this uh, pleat lines that come in like a chevron. So that actually when you wear the, when this is worn, it then is, looks more familiar as a loincloth with the chevron pleating in it. Um, and I think with the military kilt, it's probably a semicircular kilt with this loincloth worn underneath and the tail pulled out over the top and uh, it's quite secure. I haven't got a kilt with me, that's the only thing. Um, yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, I'll talk about it later on again. So, Because actually that is a whole other thing, is the military clothing, which I've really looked in detail. I've been working with Terence Duquesne on the Salakana Trove. And um, we originally were looking at the 600 uh, steely from... Um, uh, objects from Salakana, and a lot of them de uh, depict a donor. Um, there are a lot of um, uh, male donors who are wearing a military uh, 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 uniform. And um, I really had to look, I took so much time looking over them um, until I realized exactly how these, the clothing was constructed. But um, that's, that really is a whole other talk, so military, military clothing, don't get me started. So that's, this is also interesting, was the, the stitches used. Um, I use quite a fine linen, and even when I try and do something a bit rough looking, it always ends up looking quite you know, well sewn. But if you look, these are points um, or corners uh, of loincloths that were found, just fragments at Amarna. And when you see the quality of the thread, it's like string. It's quite, you know, it's a hefty thread. And the way the ends are finished off, where they've just come to a long, thin um, end and have just turned it over and then whipped it round. So you find extant, uh, costume, uh, extant, extant clothing that is of good quality, but actually has a poor sewing finish to it. But you also find rough and ready clothing which has a, is beautifully sewn so it doesn't always show. Now the Tarkan dress, um, I just really wanted to talk about the seams used on this. Um, again it's not the kind of seaming and um, hand finishing that we would normally use uh, in a western sewing tradition. Um, edges tend to be hand rolled and I can pass this round if you want to have a look at it. The edges are hand rolled and then whip stitched over. And uh, do you want to have a little look? Just pass it round. And I try to use authentic um, s seams. So again, I'm, I'm looking at um, a replica clothing that I've made that's been worn extensively to see what happens to it. And quite honestly, it, it stands up pretty well. The only kind of damage there, there was on this one, this was actually made for Reading Museum, who wanted clothes for children to wear. And they, um, over their archaeology week, they were getting a thousand people in a day for their Egyptology um, sessions. And the thing with Reading Museum is they have a mezzanine floor and the children could dress up and they had uh, water lilies to hold and feather fans and they would process all the way around this mezzanine floor and they, w they loved it, they really enjoyed wearing the clothes but when they came back I said I would repair them and wash them and send them back to them it was interesting where things had torn, where what had gone wrong and that's this style of dress is very robust and the only place it does rip, in this case, just that um, front yoke has come away. But it's gone across the stitching, so it's easy to repair. That one's, that's, no, that's not a problem. Um, this is from Julian Vogel, Sang Eastwood again. 
and just looking at all the different types of seeming that she's noted. And um, they are quite, some of them are quite unusual, the idea of putting two seams side by side and then overlocking, uh, not overlocking, um, uh, sort of overstitching between the two. Uh, raw edges were quite often left, uh, but um, there again, there is a, like a fell seam in there as well. So also with the hemming, more of a whip stitch um, action rather than um, the way that we would hem uh, a dress which is more of a haute couture level of western tailoring and again it's, uh, these are some uh, seams again with this, this whip stitch on a rolled edge and again really sturdy thread I don't think if an ancient Egyptian had made my version of this dress it would have come undone Okay, this um, next garment, is, this is just this standard mezzes or um, bag tunic. I hate the word tunic. I think it's, <laughs> this, is a, a, this is quite a, a large one. I don't know, I went a bit mad with this one. But it's very difficult to actually find very, very fine linen. And in fact, I've got to a stage now where the finest one I can find to work in is the one that that dress is made out of, which is uh, Sarunda linen. And it comes from uh, a place called Whaley's of Bradford. And I've left some samples there so you can just have a look at all the different types of linen you can buy. But linen is a fashion fabric and it's made for a fashion industry. So whatever is fashionable at this moment is what, what uh, they'll be weaving and um, so I, I find it quite difficult to find anything that's really really suitable and this happens with also ancient Egyptian linen uh, that the very finest you can get is so fine that it doesn't have the constitution of a modern linen and it's more like a silk organza and, but it has a drape to it, so it drapes like a Georgette. And we just don't make linen like that. So I'm afraid I've, um, you know, after saying I'll only make things out of linen, I've start, I have, I've gone to making them out of silk. And just to see if I, you know, just to experience the drape of it. And that's a silk and viscose. And that would be for making a... Uh, a complex ra a wrap dress that for uh, wrapping and tying and already it's got such a drape to it and it's just uh, you know if I could get that in linen then I would I would use it but I have to use what I can get then this garments again very sort of standard but from here I made my replica up and this is one of the children's ones that came back from Reading Museum. And you probably can't quite see it. It's a bit like this slide. But just, where's the little pen gone? Just there. Um, I've had this problem quite a few times. That, that as the dress goes, uh, as the garment goes on, people pull it over their heads. It tends to rip. That's its weak point. They also rip just along the shoulder line. And um, it's actually made with a, a rolled edge and then a little tie fastened on so that it ties around the neck. And I just thought, it, it just doesn't work. It needs to be a, a stronger finish to it. So I started making mine where I, I get the cord and I roll the neckline round the little cord so it reinforces all the neck. And I was quite pleased with myself with that. But I thought, I can't actually use it because, you know, I can't just use that in my work because I haven't actually seen an ancient Egyptian one. Um, I went to uh, Turin and in the tomb of Ka there are his garments and lo and behold they have his, that's been constructed and it has been whipped round uh, over the cord but the Egyptian, ancient Egyptian one is even better than mine because, well it obviously would be but um, this opening here is much wider at the base than mine so it spreads the stress and also that cord is whipped 
all round there as well. So they've, uh, on the high quality garments, they've got a high quality finish and it, was, it would strengthen all the, all the neck. Also, I was, I was ironing like mad last night and I didn't iron this one because when you see the garments from the Tomb of Tutankhamun, they're often folded and I don't, don't really know. It's whether it's our obsession with ironing via the Victorians, uh, whether it would be such a, a, an obsession for the Egyptians. Um, we like nice iron flat surfaces, you know, garments. But this one is um, creased where it's been stored. And maybe that would be just how they wore it. Wouldn't it be better to wear something that looked like you had so many at home that they were stored one on top of the other? And I don't think it, you know, they would have actually sat outside with a hot stone ironing linen. Also from, um, this is also from Amana. Gillian uh, Bogle-Sangis would mention these little roundels that she kept finding, uh, textile uh, fragments. And um, they, are, they are just the, the cut-out holes from that tunic. And what I do like about it is when I cut out mine, this little thing, um, you have to kind of stab through the material so that you can get your scissors in. And it's even got a little stab hole there where you get in and, and start, start off the same hole. Also, from wearing it, um, I've, I noticed that the hole has to be placed slightly forward from the shoulder line, about a, an inch below the shoulder line. And that's because the measurement from the nape of the neck down to the floor is longer than the cove of the neck, which is that little socket there, down to the floor. And the Egyptians took that on board because otherwise it just keeps travelling back. And you, I'm sure you've all had clothes where you're pulling the neck down. Okay, I'm just uh, going on to look at um, Horam Heb. And, and now we can say it's Horam Heb and his first wife, not an unknown couple in the British Museum. And uh, looking at this lovely pleating here, and um, yes, pleating is, well, has been the bane of my life. Um, I, if I'm doing a lot of pleating for television again, I will send it off to cement pleating of Potter's Bar because this takes a long time. But I thought, right, what I'll do is I want to get a complete dress length. So that's, um, I think it's about 60 inches wide, this linen. And um, there's over three meters of it. And I thought, I'll hand pleat the whole lot myself. It took three days. And um, the way I do it is just how Rosin was uh, demonstrating, just with folding over an edge and pleating it down. I use my grandmother's um, uh, rolling pin to give it a good whack. And then I also roll it so that um, you get the sharp edge. Um, I then tie it up with little ties and this you know over three meters of fabric ends up that I can hold it in two hands it's so condensed down and that's the finished thing and I put it outside and it was uh, drying outside for three days in an English summer so moderately warm and um, the thing is that now that I've done this I don't want to undo it because the thought of doing it again is it's just too awful so the the pleating, there are two different types of pleating. Um, the hand pleating, and then Salima was mentioning about um, a version of pleating where, uh, which is called antique pleating. And this is, this is one I did earlier. And this is a slightly rougher. These ones, uh, the pleats, you can make very, very regular. And you can see on the Tarkan dress how it's, you know, I've, I've took a long time pleating all those, and it does take a while. But as Rosalind has said, what does it matter? It's our, con our, our pre conceptions of time, and if your job is pleating, then you, know, you do it and you enjoy it. So, <laughs> so, so that's uh, the dress that's pleated up. Again, this is, this is going to be slightly more like a, a bark effect. 
I'm afraid this is very dirty, it's washed, but it was filmed in a studios where, I don't know why they always do it, but they, they always have to have braziers with smoke billowing everywhere and, and, you know, men love doing it and everything gets really smoky and you end up with, like, you know, smoke all around your face and the makeup artists go around with long cotton buds, sticks, and the actors will be waiting on set and they just come up with this cotton bud and they, they wipe all around the inside of their noses. So talk about health and safety. It's just it's horrible. <laughs> um, so that's why it's a dirty white because um, I just couldn't get it white enough. So this would, uh, could be wrapped into a dress. And, uh, but it's a length of textile. It could be used for anything. And that's the beauty of these garments is that Linen, I think, was such a precious commodity, so valued, that you couldn't just um, keep um, a, a piece of linen as, you know, just one, for one purpose. So, for instance, where they've taken, this could be used for all sorts of different things. It could be just put on the bed. It could be a picnic blanket, even. But once you cut a hole in a piece of linen like that, you've destroyed its integrity, and it now is just... It can only be one thing. And so committing a piece of your cloth to that one um, purpose, you know, it's, it doesn't come lightly. Whereas a, a, a long sheet of uh, fabric can be made into all sorts of things. So that's, that's the antique plead. You come and have a look at these afterwards. And then, as I said, that's the, that's the sort of finer version, which is uh, commercially... You can just buy that commercially. Now then, what's this? So, this is how you do... This is a version of doing antique pleating by, um, from Lara Doot. And it's, it's those Indian-type cotton skirts that um, we have all worn at one time or another. And uh, it's just a way of, of drying it. I've seen lots of versions. That's Salima, you're, you know, I've seen that version where uh, it's tied around a, a, a pole. I've seen one where it was tied onto a tree and uh, from a branch of a tree. And then it, all the fabric was scooped up and, and twisted round and then secured at the bottom by a string with a big stone on it. And um, so uh, lots of... Uh, different societies have ways of making this, this uh, effect. Okay, and uh, so this is uh, then what I can do with these pleated uh, cloths. So these are, this would be sort of like a New Kingdom style dress. And it's in two pieces. There's um, a wraparound dress, which is just like a sarong underneath, and then a shawl that goes over the top. Um, my problem uh, I find is that the modern linen isn't um, wide enough to make a complete dress. It's always a bit short. So um, whereas I'd like that shawl to be right down on ground level, it's, it's coming up a bit short. And this is a, another version where it's, the shawl is taken over one side and secured with a knot under, under the breast. So, and then I've got a these are a later uh, style of dress, and this is um, from a statue of Cleopatra VII dressed as a, a, a priestess from the uh, cult of Isis. And that construction is completely different. Uh, it's very attractive, but it, it isn't a, I don't think that's an Egyptian style at all. And if you look back at this, that looks Egyptian, that looks Greek. Egyptian, Greek. <laughs> and that's um, the same style of dress, but that's got a shoulder drape on it. But still, looks, it's a nice looking dress on. Um, after I made the clothes, I remember the first time I actually put them a white dress on a model, and I was very excited and would wrap the dress on. And when she had it on, I thought, it looks awful. And I realized that it's only part of it. Um, the Egyptians were very clever because they're using color combinations which are specifically for um, ancient Egyptian uh, skin color. So the white on the brown skin looks absolutely beautiful. The colors of the jewelry just 
compliment the every, you know, everything, the black hair um, and the makeup. So I then had to think about, I've, I've got to get some jewelry. Um, thinking that you can just go out and buy a broad collar that actually looks all right, forget it. So I ended up making them. And this was all a bit of a... Well, let's show you this one because it hasn't got a... So th this one is... Um, I made up... Of course, you can't buy the beads either, so I had to make the beads. And these are made out of uh, FIMO, which is a coloured polymer clay, and you fire it in the oven at home. Um, if you look on the screen, the back bars there were just a little um, element that came from a brooch, I think. And, um, and they weren't quite right, so that annoyed me. So I ended up making my, my own back bars or terminals there. And these are brass, they're not real gold. So I made the necklaces, and something like this one weighs half a kilo. And these are bone sprayed gold paint. And what I was finding was I'd put them on an actor, and it was fine if they just stood completely still. But if they had the audacity to move around, then it began to shift a bit. And especially if they le leant forward, then the whole waist of the necklace would end up and you know, quite often get a nice big red mark around the back of their neck. So obviously the counterweight was important. So I started off experimenting with counterweights. And um, I thought, well, my big gold necklace weighs half a kilo, so I'll just put half a kilo off the back. And I nearly garroted myself. <laughs> and, but I talked to a friend of mine who's got a degree in maths, and she said, you don't want to do that. She, she explained that the weight of the necklace is held on the shoulders and, um, and on the back of the neck. So the only um, point is this section here in the front that is unsupported. So you then have to calculate, well, she did it for me, um, you have to calculate the weight of that area, and then the counterweight uh, will balance it. But saying that, again, it, it works to a certain degree, but um, if, again, we're, we're looking at uh, working on, a, on the film set, uh, quite often they'll always have some violent scene of death where my actor is stabbed or garroted or, you know, given to something, <laughs> has some appalling death. And they always fall on the floor, and there's this great clatter as, you know, the, the necklace all falls on the floor. Um, but it's, it's really, you know, it's, uh, it's just interesting to see what actually happens to the necklace in that situation. And um, it, it, they can do quite a lot of damage when you fall on them, I can guarantee it. Um, most of those one, let's see, oh, it's the next slide. That little necklace there was um, one of the first ones I tried out, so it's a bit slightly primitive. It's meant to be a Marna style. And um, I had some Venetian beads, which I'd kept since the 1970s, those little green ones there. And um, I had some, got some glass beads, and I made some, a mold and made up some little elements. Um, but uh, I, I'm, the bit I'm most proud of is these beads, which are macaroni painted and I made that quite a long time ago and you know it's, it's, it's still wearable so um, the other thing I'm just thinking with the necklace if I put it on a woman wearing a complex wrap dress um, what I found was that the weight of the necklace controls all the fabric so if you're not wearing uh, the necklace, the fabric sort of like it all starts to shift around, and um, uh, it's it's. Uh, I don't want to make really make references towards saris, but it was interesting for me watching people wearing these dresses. How much time they have to correct it, and with something like an Egyptian toga, you have to correct all the time, and um, whereas something like a a, a, a sari. Um, I've, there's this lovely book um, about saris, and the woman who wrote it said that um, when the young girls first wear their first sari, um, it's pinned into place, it has pins on it. 
But as they mature, the pins are taken away, and there's this, this almost slight anxiety that at some point the dr it could come adrift. But because of it, it makes the woman walk properly and, um, and uh, be very conscious and very aware of her clothing at all times. And this is what I, I was finding with these complex wrap dresses, is that they stayed fairly secure, but with a necklace on, it controlled all the top and it stopped it from unraveling. And so on set, I wasn't having to go up and tighten up uh, dresses and rearrange people. So, and this is, um, this is mummy forensics. Um, oh, he's a bit dark, unfortunately. So there he's wearing that big collar. He's the one who kept having to plummet to the floor. Um, and but this is one of the only decent wigs I've ever seen. And uh, for a side wig, it's, it's a difficult look. And I've only got a couple of minutes more. So, um, it's a difficult look to carry, I think, this type of wig. But uh, this was made by um, a friend of ours. Um, and he's a wig maker. And the fineness of it, in fact, I think it's too fine. I think it's actually so beautiful if you compare it with uh, wigs that you see in um, uh, the museum that the hair can be quite coarse so I'll just whip on quick um, this is this is from the Petrie Museum this is a, a third intermediate period uh, very sad actually looking garment which is it's been photographed on a table with tissue paper that's what these lines are and books um, that's the neck opening there, which corresponds to that, but that's the shoulder level's probably about there. And I made a reconstruction of this. Um, it's got couching on it, which uh, goes across all the shoulders and down the front. And the couching is useful because it can be used as a darning technique, but also it's a decorative technique. So I made my one up, and when it came back, from the Petrie Museum after a summer of children trying it on. It had gone a bit there, and it had come a bit adrift under there. But um, just finally, um, Jan Picton and I went to a really lovely study day uh, given by the Medieval Dress and Ancient Textile Society at the V&A. And this is a, a garment from the V&A. Um, it's late, it's late, um, it's the Islamic period. I was very interested in what this would look like on. Um, I've always wondered why you have these roundels of embroidery on these shoulders, and then a gap, and then these long cuffs. And uh, we found a very nice gentleman who, I, who was more than delighted to put, try it on. And these were taken on my phone, so they're a bit rubbish photographs. But what's interesting here is on this arm, that roundel lies there. The fabric folds in behind, and then the um, sleeve then comes up to meet the roundel. So you have all that area is then covered in, in um, uh, embroidery. So I, I was very impressed by that. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's the end. <laughs>